this is a continuation of lecture number 25 on Brazil. And when we left off last time, you recall that we had just discussed the, uh, in, uh, the application of electric telegraphy in Brazil and uh, the fact that it had had some great initial success in detecting illegal landing of slaves. Um, now, the next big advance in telegraphy in Brazil came as a consequence of the war that was being fought against Paraguay. Um, and at this particular time, the real government decided that it would form, a, create an electric, a, a telegraphic train so that it could uh, keep uh, Rio more accurately advised as to how the war was progressing on the ground. And uh, it was decided that Rio should be placed in telegraphic connection with the North and the South. And in May of 1870, Charles T. Bright, E.B. Webb, and William Jones received a 60-year concession to lay a submarine cable to the North and South of Rio de Janeiro. The northern terminal would be the city of Pará and the southern San Pedro, um, thus practically extending along the entire coast of Brazil. This concession also gave the syndicate authority to link up its northern cable routes with transatlantic lines to Europe and to the United States of North America, and this directive or telegraphic connection be established with the following provinces. To the north, uh, Rio de Janeiro, Espirito Santo, Bahia, Sidipe, Algoas, Pernambuco, Pariba, Chara, Paui, and Maranhão. To the south, Sao Paulo, Marana, and Santa Catarina. With concessions, these concessions were valid for 60 years from the date of signing of the contract. During this period, the government would not permit any other submarine cable to be laid to any point reached by the cable of the syndicate and the cable had to be in operation within two years from the date of signing of the contract. At the expiration of the concession, the cable and the landline plant that went along with it should revert to the Brazilian government without indemnity. The government reserved the right to take over the cable after the first 10 years of actual operation at a price to be settled by arbiters. Now this is obviously a contract that the uh, uh, entrepreneurs were willing to sign under any conditions. They just wanted in there. <clears throat> I know what that's like. I've, I've <laughs> negotiated a few land leases for oil drilling that way, only to find out, at least in one case later on, that it wasn't such a good idea after all, but that is another matter. In 1873, the concession obtained by the syndicate was transferred to the Telegraph Construction and Maintenance Company Limited, which in turn transferred it to the Western and Brazilian Telegraph Company. Telegraph service between Rio and the eight provinces of Bahia, Pernambuco, and Pará began on December 24, 1875, and the first messages being sent by the Emperor of Brazil congratulated the three provinces for such a proud achievement. The report of the Minister of Commerce submitted during the first session of the 14th Congress of Brazil gives the extent of the state telegraph plant in 1869 as follows. We have at present 316 leagues, that is about 1,297 miles of telegraph, besides 40 leagues, or 164 miles, under construction, and 75 leagues, 307 miles, already authorized to be built. Up to 1869, the government had spent $93,000 on the telegraph, an expenditure of $44.55 per kilometer of line. Only after 1864 did the construction of telegraph lines in Brazil receive any encouragement. Meanwhile, in the neighboring republics of Argentina and Uruguay, the telegraph had rapidly developed so that their lines approached close to the frontiers of Brazil and made international telegraphic communication highly desirable. Now, the first international telegraph line was constructed by an English firm and extended from the boundary of Uruguay to Jairal, Brazil. Soon afterwards, another concern laid a cable to the city of Rio Grande. In 1871, the Telegraph Administration finished a line to Curitiba, province of Parana, and one connecting Pelotas and Porto Alegre, province of Rio Grande do Sul. The Hagaro office at the southern frontier of Brazil was open for service on October 29, 1871. The most important event of the following year was the granting of a 20-year concession to 
by decree in August 1872 to Baron de Maua to lay and operate a submarine cable between Portugal and Brazil and the Portuguese possessions and stipulated that the cable should start from the Cape of San Roque, province of Rio Grande do Norte, and should go to via Cape Verde Islands on Madeira to Lisbon. By decree in 1873, June, Baron de Mao was to transfer this concession to the Brazilian Submarine Telegraph Company Limited. The latter arranged with the Telegraph Construction and Maintenance Company Limited to perform the work of laying cable and service, and that was inaugurated in 1874. During 1873, the telegraph was extended to the city of Itapirim, province of Espirito Santo, which also made possible the continuation of that line to Maceo, the province of Alagoas in northern Brazil. The gain in important telegraph lines in the south <coughs> is noteworthy, the branch from Santos to Sao Paulo being of particular importance. 1884 witnessed the completion of the telegraph to San Luis, province of Maranao, by order of the Emperor Don Pedro II. The telegraph stations included on this line were open to the public in December 1884. The day before the inauguration of the service, Dr. Kapanema, Director General of Telegraphs, with the assistance of Dr. Eduardo Jones, manager of the Uruguayan Telegraphs, arranged to have a message sent from Teresina in the province of Piuí via San Luis to Montevideo, a distance of 9,700 kilometers, or 6,023 miles. The experiment proved an entire success, the message taking only six minutes to pass between the two terminal points. Now at this point, imperialist rivalry becomes the most important factor in construction of telegraphs. The German South American Telegraph Company began making plans to connect Brazil to Europe in 1909. The distance between Germany and Brazil was too great for a direct cable connection, and the Cologne Company was decided to connect them in segments beginning with Tenerife. This would connect the German Western African colonies to Germany and then they could go to Brazil. However, as things worked out, the German Caps completed their connection to Brazil via a combination of undersea cable and radio cable broadcasting on June 20, 1914, which is, as you know, right before the outbreak of the First World War. The World Cap classes were about to start World War I and the completion of the Brazil connection would have to wait until the end of that war in December 1918. So, to recap, I have reviewed the spread of telegraphy to Brazil because it reflects the first way in which the Common Terms plan of action was picked up via the newswire. Even earlier Leninists of the Uruguayan Socialist Movement formed the Communist Party of Uruguay on September 21, 1920. Argentine Communists had made the decision to join the Common Turn because of the newswire in 1921. Then these Argentine Communists immediately sought recognition via their Chilean comrades already in Mexico City with Jose Allen, which we reviewed in our discussion of Chile. The Brazilian Communist Party, in Portuguese the Partido Comunista Brasileiro, abbreviated as the PCB, was founded on March 25, 1922 in the cities of Sao Paulo, Santos, Cruzeiro, Porto Alegre, Recife, Niterói, Luis de Fora, and Rio de Janeiro, and they met and approved the party statutes at the 21 conditions that they had read about on the newswire for entering the Communist International, but the PCB itself was not recognized by the common turn for another few years because there was uh, so much confusion about what was going on over there. Um, First of all, the common turn didn't even know how they found out about it. So, uh, at any rate, at the end of that particular meeting, uh, 73 delegates of the party ended up singing the international and uh, voted themselves in according to Lenin's 21 points, and eventually they were accepted. Uh, now, let's go back to what was happening industrially in Brazil. Brazil was still primarily an agricultural country when it began to be flooded with immigrants around the turn of the century. Many immigrants were brought, as we've seen, into Brazil to work the country's numerous coffee plantations. Unfortunately for plantation owners, many of these immigrants just kept on moving because they did not want to replace the slave labor force who had been freed only a few years before. One Italian journalist writing for the Italian Geographical Society remarked <coughs> that the plantation owners of Sao Paulo 
simply wanted to replace black slaves with white slaves. Many of these immigrants just kept on moving, therefore, and finally settled in Brazil's two major industrial centers, Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. Once immigrants started to arrive, they found out how bad things were, and I reviewed that last time, so uh, they quickly tried to work themselves out of that situation. In industrially, Brazil slowly grew as the textile center for South America. The port cities of Santos and Rio de Janeiro shipped much of Brazil's coffee and rubber overseas to European and American markets. Brazil's ruling class still operated as if they were in the slave economy, demanding sun-up to sundown labor, both in the fields and in the factories. As you recall, I compared this to Candyland in Mississippi. I think of all of Brazil as being like Candyland, the interior, I mean. The popular opinion that the ruling class shared about class division in their society was to completely deny it, and um, that you know, it was obviously just a propaganda move. Um, the president of Sao Paulo, when asked about class division, said, Among us Brazilians, there is frank democracy and a complete absence of social classes. Well, at any rate, with a developing industrial economy and a massive interior filled with natural resources, Brazil was making itself one of South America's leading economic centers. Brazil, although it was growing slowly, remained a minor industrial scale center on a global scale until World War I came, and uh, Brazil was cut off from its trading partners. Consequently, it was forced to develop itself industrially to make up for what could not be imported from Europe or America. And this can be seen in the startling growth of Brazil's leading cities at the time. As I mentioned before, I think, in 1900, Sao Paulo had, 200, had a quarter of a million people and 22,000 buildings. In 1918, at the end of the war, um, they had half a million people and 55,000 buildings. So, but these people knew that the industry and the government were totally corrupt. And so anarchism, which was the one political form which these people had with them, um, was something that already recognized all of this, and uh, none of this was very much news to them. The uh, huge number of people that came into Brazil at that time to go into these textile factories were of the anarchist political persuasion, meaning they didn't even want to be Brazilian citizens. They just wanted to work and uh, get paid for their labor in a proper, and on a proper scale. During the war, they were able to get a lot of this because there wasn't an awful lot of things you could do if you were a capitalist other than to go along with labor demands if you wanted to produce something for the internal market, which was definitely there, now that there was no, nothing coming from the imperialist countries. Well, I won't go back over all of that, except to say that uh, the anarchists got stronger during this period than they had ever been at any other time. They shared a common dislike of the Catholic Church with everybody that was already there, and uh, they preached against alcoholism, much as they had when they were back in Europe. Actually, nothing had changed in terms of the anarchist pitch. Uh, the only thing that had really changed was that uh, large numbers of, for the first time, the largest number of people of any global cosmopolitan metropolitan center were anarchists and uh, nothing else. Now, the 1917 revolution has not yet come, so they don't have Marxism and a form of Leninism to adhere to yet, but it's on its way. Anarchism drew its early strength from the artisan class who valued self-teaching and individual enterprise and therefore saw a rise in industry as a threat to their way of life. It was in this immigrant population that Brazil's most active anarchists dwelled. One of Brazil's most active fields and areas for anarchist action were the stonecutters, of Greater Sao Paulo. Stone cutting, by its very nature, was an independent activity. Stone cutters were not paid a wage. They profited in small groups of workers and got paid on the delivery of finished products. They needed neither the government nor the employer. Why are their positions as skilled workers who could not easily be replaced when they struck or withdrew their labor over an issue of immediate action would be taken to remedy the problem by the people 
the stone cutters worked for. In this sense, direct action as a political philosophy made sense to them. In contrast, factory workers, because of the nature of their work and the ease of replacing the workforce, were often subjected to longer, more drawn-out strikes. There was often tension among Brazil's diverse populations in this area. Among the Italians and Portuguese, for example, the labor movement was often divided among, along racial lines. Language was the chief barrier as the most labor publications and radical newspapers in Brazil up until no 1920 were published in Italian. Union locals were often divided by language. Only minor conflicts arose between the European immigrants. The serious divisions among races in Brazil took place between native Brazilians and African Brazilians and the massive immigrant populations. Immigrants constantly complained that the Brazilians had no class consciousness and no passion for working class issues. Often the Brazilians would be used as scabs to break up immigrant strikes. In the world of organized labor, a person who turns their back on his fellow workers and agrees to replace a striking worker is considered the lowest form of human scum. This division created by the employing class in Brazil created a huge gulf between these two populations. The tensions over Brazilians, often blacks, crossing immigrant picket lines created distrust and hate between these two groups that otherwise would have shared many things in common. When you, if you go back and read the chapters on the formation of the U.S. labor movement, you'll see that this division of the U.S. white working class uh, into racial lines, I mean, well, what, you can call them racial lines if you like, in, into national lines uh, between uh, people from Italy and people from Poland and so on in Chicago were some of the biggest problems that our organizers had to confront, and yet they did it very successfully. One of the reasons that William C. Foster became a leader of the U.S. Communist Party was because he was the one who had said, our number one enemy is racism. We have to defeat that first if we're going to organize our unions and shut down these factories. And so he set about doing it. At any rate, um, the view uh, within the working class between of scabs and, and uh, striking workers is kind of like the view that uh, you see in that movie Django Unchained where Jamie, Lee, Jamie Foxx tells his mentor a slave, a black slaver, is even lower than a house nigger boss. And that is pretty goddamn low. <laughs> so his, his colleague tells him, well, play it that way then. Be the worst kind of black slaver you can imagine. Well, anyway, so these, these are the kind of things they had to overcome. There was often uh, all kinds of fighting going on between these different groups but between the Africans and the other immigrants and between the different national groups of immigrants and uh, it would take a while for all of this to be overcome. Occasionally an Afro-Brazilian group would form a socialist organization like the Brazil Novo newspaper that was founded by a black lawyer named Gurana Santana in 1932. Immigrants often charged that Brazilians had no working class traditions to draw on. While the Brazilians may not have had a specific working class tradition to draw on, many anarchists were impressed with the inhabitants of rural Brazil's ability to exist peacefully with very little government interference. Oresti Ristori, a famous Brazilian anarchist writing for a Geneva newspaper, wrote that whole areas of Brazil are free of government. One could travel for weeks, even months, without seeing a policeman, that the, that the law everyone respected was work. The diverse anarchists of Brazil sponsored and took part in many activities besides the labor movement. Brazil was particularly well known for instituting Francisco Ferrer free schools. Francisco Ferrer was inter an internationally known anarchist educator who was murdered in his homeland by Spanish officials for criticizing the Catholic Church as an educational institution. Free schools were anarchist-run institutions built on learning through free exploration of ideas rather than forced information. Besides education, the anarchist was often at the cultural forefront of Brazil, 
They were the only group that tried to bring the plays to the poor working class. They also published literary works not related to politics in their newspaper, like uh, Free Earth. They always organized celebrations and festivals on the traditional anarchist holidays like May 1st, November 11th, March 18th. Anarchism was not a simple one-sided political philosophy, but rather a complex ideology with a diverse movement in Brazil. Now, from 1900 to 1910, the anarchists did not break out of their isolation until 1902 when many started to take an active interest in the development of trade unions. The first major strike in Brazil occurred in Rio in 1903 when workers at the Aliaca textile mill walked off the job. Now this strike paralyzed Rio de Janeiro for 20 days when over 40,000 workers from all the city's textile mills went on strike demanding better conditions and pay. Most strikers did not win, uh, most of these demands the strikers did not win, but they did get their key demands which well, not all of them. They settled, they wanted an eight hour day, they settled for nine and a half hour work day. Um, but still, that was a substantial amount of progress. So the first Brazilian Labor Pro uh, Congress was held in 1906. The major event of this Congress was the founding of the Cong Congresso Operario Brasileiro, COB. This new labor system was based on anarcho syndicalism. The system of organization the Congress endorsed was the federation system where unions were held in loose association but retained their individual autonomy. This federation system was directly based on the radical French anarchist, anarcho-syndicalist union, the CGT. In the anarchist federation system there exists no paid officials, only temporary officers, and no official leaders. Many of the workers in urban Brazil were actually not industrial workers, but instead worked in the cities extensive service industries. It was just these types of workers who struck in 1906 at the Paulista Company Railroad. The government reacted quickly to an, the anarchist strike that threatened the British transportation network. Immediately the government sent 500 soldiers to break up the strike. Attorneys who tried to help strikers were arrested and this government stopped all telegraph service in all areas around the strikers. Next, the government went to the company housing that they provided railroad workers and started kicking families out of their homes. The government and the Catholic Church did not know how to handle their urban poor striking. Catholic leaders sent leaders to the strikers, letters to the strikers, excuse me, asking them to call off the strike, but even the urgings of the church could not stop the strikers. The real reaction came when Santos workers threatened a sympathy strike. The immediate reaction of the government was to send warships to that port city. Leaders in government and industry had good reason to fear a sympathy strike in Santos. As Santos was regarded as Brazil's most radical city, it earned the nickname Little Barcelona, which, by the way, had, was an anarchist uh, stronghold at that time. The COB, one of Brazil's leading anarchist labor organizations, always had higher membership numbers in Santos. In 1907, shortly after the COB was created, Santos had Brazil's highest concentration of organized labor and four times the members of the Rio de Janeiro unions, 22,500 in Santo and 5,000 in Rio, 12,500 in Sao Paulo. Santos had the highest concentration of anarcho syndicalists in Brazil for several reasons. Since the city served as a port and a satellite city for Sao Paulo, it consisted of very little industry. The residents of Santos were highly skilled laborers compared to Brazil's other major cities. Working in a port city provided for constant interaction with anarchists, socialists, and communists who were arriving from Europe and other South American countries. Santos tended to be a city of single men in the anarchist movement. Men with families were more likely to live in the larger cities of Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro. A workforce of single men without the burden of families is going to have the flexibility to take more chances and less fear of the consequences of direct action than men who had to support a family. In this respect, Santos shared more things in common with the huge anarchist movement in Argentina where families were rare as the concentration of men over women was greater. The next strike to shake Brazil was a general strike in the textile industry of Sao Paulo in 1907. 
it was a short, unsuccessful strike. After the enthusiasm of 1906 and 1907, Brazilian labor went into a bit of a lull and little activity took place. The anarchists continued to publish their newspapers, organize their free schools, but little activity took place until the massive resurgence of 1912. Now, while labor activity slowed down for about five years through, um, in the last decade, or in the first decade, the, uh, the seeds for further revolt were being planted in the minds of the workers. During this time, Brazil's leading anarchist paper, Free Earth, published 75 issues and kept a weekly readership averaging around 4,000. The paper was being recognized on an international scale when Peter Kropokin, the famous Russian anarchist, wrote to the paper, thanking them for a donation uh, to the Russian anarchist movement and, build, and publishing a fine newspaper. Now, Kropotkin was, of course, leading the anarchists at the same time that Lenin is now leading the Bolsheviks in Russia. This lull in labor activity fit right into the anarchist plan for organizing. Their pattern for years was that organizers would spread propaganda among workers. When unrest happened, as a late, um, for whatever reason, their labor, labor or agitators would organize a ad hoc union for a strike. If the strike was successful, then the union was kept going. If the strike failed, then the union failed. This was the pattern of labor organizing that anarchists employed all throughout the 1910s and 1920s. The COB was not the only labor organization attracting workers along anarchist lines. The Workers' Federation of Sao Paulo, FOSP, was very militant among many fields um, between 1908 and 1912, especially among construction workers in Sao Paulo, where there was so much construction going on. These construction workers, like the stonecutters of Sao Paulo, were very aggressive in their demands and their actions. One strike in Rio Grande do Sul, which was led by the city's uh, FOS syndicate by 1913, this group, which had its headquarters in Porte Alegre, represented 42% of all the Federation's members. Textile workers had always been considered hard to organize for Brazilian anarchists because in 1911, for example, 72 percent of all textile workers in Sao Paulo were women and children. These textile workers were not altogether cautious, though they probably just seemed harder to organize because there were so many textile factories. Between 1901 and 1914, 26 of the 75 strikes in Sao Paulo somehow involved textile workers, even though these were almost all women and, and children. In general, though, labor was considered to be in decline between 1908 and 1912. This resurgence was strong when in 1912 anarcho-syndicalist unions represented over 60,000 workers in Brazil. This new wave of unionization carried Brazil toward its second National Labor Congress, which took place in Rio in 1913. The themes for this Congress were simple shorter hours, better pay, and safe working conditions. Also, it was obvious to them that World War I was about to start, that the capitalists were about to start it, and so they were strongly in favor of opposing this war one year before it broke out. Many were impressed with the Santos Labor Federation's plan to recruit members strictly along anarchist lines. Brazil experienced a depression in 1913 and 1914, but the labor movement was uh, only slightly slowed down. In 1915, Rio de Janeiro hosted an international South American anarcho-syndicalist conference with delegates attending from Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, and five Brazilian states. The major themes for this conference was building an anti-war movement to oppose the war in Europe. Brazil was unique in that it maintained a large and often stable organized labor force capable of conducting numerous strikes, while at the same time constantly having a surplus of labor. This may prove more towards the Brazilian racism of the Brazilian ruling class than the solidarity of the working class as the, uh, as the ruling class preferred to pay European immigrant women and children to work rather than uh, use the country's massive Afro-Brazilian population. 
Industrial employers, on the whole, considered blacks to be fit for menial labor only, as they were considered inferior to Europeans. 1917, the year of the strike, which of course is also the year of the Russian revolutions. The years 1917 through 1920 represent the height of Brazil's worker-led movement. The winter of 1917 is considered one of the South America's most impressive displays of human solidarity and radical labor activity, which, by the way, is also the summer of 1917 in Russia. Then, just as quickly as the match ignited, the flame would burn the match until only a smolder of what was before remained. Brazil's labor unrest was ignited, not by political ambitions, but instead by the ambitions of bread. In 1916 and the first part of 1917, Brazil was experiencing a huge increase in the cost of living in food and fuel prices. This rise was dramatic and combined with non-increases in wages and the populations of industrial cities like Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro were not happy. Any attempt to better conditions or pay was quickly turned down and in June of 1917 workers at the Controfisia Crespi plant in the Moco district of Sao Paulo asked for a 25% wage increase Although business was booming, the request was turned down. Unions like the FOSP that had started in 1917 with membership around 30,000 organized rallies to protest the high cost of living. At one such of these rallies on July 11th, a common worker who had no connection with the rally, Antonio Martinez, was beaten to death by Sao Paulo police. Sao Paulo erupted in shock at the brutal death of a 21-year-old apolitical worker. Antonio Martinez's funeral was a massive event. The funeral procession marched throughout the city, and at one point the police confronted the mourners. After a shuffle, the police began to attack the crowds. Police on horseback attacked one portion of the procession with swords. The result of this was massive unrest and rioting in Sao Paulo. The next day, July 12, 15,000 workers walked out on strike. Um, soon a general strike was declared and the city was at a standstill. The government declared martial law, brought in the army. The main cause behind all the strikes was the high cost of food and the brutal death of Martinez was just a catalyst. Eventually the strike ended when the government put pressure on the industrialists to end the strike and the workers settled for a 10% wage increase. Sao Paulo was just begging uh, for, uh, for strikes in 1917. News of the unrest was not slow to reach Rio de Janeiro. When description of the strikes reached one furniture worker, of course all this is by telegram. On the morning of July 18th, he immediately walked off the job, calling for a strike at his factory. Two other workers joined him, and by the afternoon of July 18th, only 150 workers had walked out in solidarity with the strikers in Sao Paulo. On July 19th, however, five factories were on strike, and the movement was growing uncontrollably. On July 22nd, the FOSP of Rio de Janeiro called for a general strike. To their surprise, 50,000 workers went on strike on the morning of July 23rd. Later in the afternoon of July 23rd, 20,000 metal workers walked out in solidarity with the factory workers. The demands for all, that, uh, for all of this were as they always had been, uh, an eight-hour workday and a 20% wage increase. This was a textbook, spontaneous, general strike, and all of industrial Brazil was stopped and in control of the workers. The reaction of the government was swift and severe. By July 26th, the government had used all its resources and declared martial law. Army, Navy, and police were guarding all the major areas of Rio de Janeiro. You'll recall that this is when the, Tsars, uh, when the provisional government had suppressed the uh, first uh, Bolshevik uprising. And uh, the Lenin had had to go into hiding, and so had uh, all those Bolshevik leaders that could. Um, anyway, the army, the navy, the police were guarding all the major areas of Rio de Janeiro. The strike carried on into August, when the government finally realized they could not keep control of the whole population, and the government soon forced the capitalists to settle with the workers. On August second, 1917. The Rio de Janeiro general strike ended with workers settling for a 56-hour week, which wasn't the 40 they wanted, but 
it was better than what they had, and a 10% wage increase. In a few short months, Brazilian labor had shown its incredible strength and power. The workers displaced, displayed that they were powerful enough to call strikes on a national scale. The organization and influence of the anarchists played an important role in the speed by which union leaders called strikes. Traditional reformist unions have always been slow to call strikes, preferring long meetings with employers and drawn-out negotiations. The anarchist leadership of the FOSP knew the pulse and passions of the workers and had the good sense and timing to know when to call a strike at a time when they knew they could get massive worker support. The government, too, was impressed with the actions of the anarchists and realized that they had a problem with their labor unions. In September 1917, in response to open German bombing of the Brazilian merchant shipping in the South Atlantic, Brazil entered the war against the Germans. While Brazil had entered the war near its end, and they played a very small role, the Brazilian government used the war as an opportunity to solve their domestic labor problems. The Brazilian government declared that the strikes of July and August were the work of German and Italian agitators who had the backing of their respective governments to cause unrest in Brazil. The response was the deportation of hundreds of labor leaders, the closing down of labor newspapers, and the threatened deportation of anyone professing to lead labor activities in the July and August strikes. This was a devastating blow to the labor movement that it had just made so much progress with the workers. The labor forces of industrial Brazil was at this time still mostly immigrant, and most often these immigrants' worst fear was being deported from Brazil. In 1917 was the height of the anarcho-syndicalist movement in Brazil. As a result of the general strikes, the industrial employers and the government realized they had a common goal in the destruction of the anarcho-syndicalist unions. The government used World War I as an excuse to tear apart the leadership of the anarcho-syndicalist unions, but they needed a bigger event to give them an excuse for a more repressive deportation and public crackdown on all the radicals. The, the attempted revolt in 1918 signaled the decline of anarcho-syndicalism in Brazil. Well, what was that? Well, in 1918 there was an attempted revolution. The world at this time was a great place of great change and social unrest. The Telegraph, of course, had brought the news of the uh, end of October, uh, by their calendar, the early November overthrow of the uh, provisional government in Russia and the assumption of, of uh, Leninism. So 1918 uh, was that. I mean, they knew the, the World War had just come to a, an end. The, uh, all of this change had been taking place in their own country, and the Russian Revolution was in full blast. So workers truly believed that the great socialist revolution was just about upon them, and why would they have any reason to doubt that notion? The whole world at this time was in a great state of revolution as socialist governments were alive on every, con every country on the earth. When news of the Russian Revolution first reached Brazil, anarchists were ecstatic. Radicals of all sorts were convinced that the Russian Revolution had spread farther and was much more utopian than it was being described to them by the capitalist press. It was a commonly held belief among radicals everywhere that it would be only a short time to a revolution came to a town near them. It was with thoughts like these in their heads that a group of anarchist labor leaders planned the overthrow in Rio de Janeiro and eventually the entire Brazilian state of the government. With the exception of this incident, which as we see never got off the ground, Brazilian anarchism <coughs> was an incredibly peaceful movement. Bomb throwing until this time had been almost unheard of, as the Brazilian anarchists did very little to live up to the phantom notion of the violent lone anarchist bomb thrower. The 1918 revolt, on the other hand, was being planned by a group of 40 anarchist leaders who met in one of the classrooms of the group's leaders. The group had a considerable plan and arsenal for the attack. They had gathered 1,600 bombs, a detailed plan with people in all the key positions of the city, power, radio, telegraph, and transportation. In other words, pretty much what the Leninists had done. They also had over 40 barrels of gasoline ready to burn down the key structures of the government, 
the city hall, the police station, and the banks. Also included in their portfolio was a small army of about 4,000 militant anarchist union members armed and ready for street battles with the authorities. The group's plan was to take over the city and lead the workers to a general strike that would shut down all of Brazilian industry and eventually it would all fall under worker control. The plan actually never got a shot to be put into action because one of the men attending these organizational meetings was an informant for the Rio de Janeiro police and the only results were massive arrests and deportations of all involved and in some small instances of street fighting. The majority of the labor movement and the majority of the anarchists never had any knowledge of the plan but they certainly felt the rep repression that followed as this incident gave the government of Brazil full authority to persecute those in anarchist and labor movements. Actions like this attempted revolt were a direct result of the Russian Revolution, which had an enormous effect on the radical labor movement in Brazil. So, now in 1919, there was another important year in the development of Brazilian labor. You will recall that this is the year that things start to turn for the Bolsheviks uh, so much so that Lenin's able to call for the first uh, Congress of the Communist International or the Third International. Uh, it signaled, 1919 signaled the turning point in Brazilian labor history when control of organized labor shifted from the anarcho-syndicalist to the reformist unions. The year consisted of many strikes and for the first time the strikes went to different regions of Brazil including Bahia, Pernambuco, Rio Grande do Sul, as well as Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, and Santos, all had consistent labor activity. 1919 was the year that Brazil enacted a workers' compensation law. As the art anarchists would be fond of pointing out, the government would create all the laws they wanted to because it made no difference in the lives of the workers, as this labor law was quickly ignored by Brazil's employing class. The first major strike of 1919 took place in early May, and sections of it lasted until June and July. It's important to note that even during a general strike, the uh, workers would often strike for a few days and then return to a job as another or fa factory or section of a factory went out on strike, so it was like a rolling general strike. This tactic frustrated the anarchist labor leaders who saw it as a determinant to achieving the end result. The simple truth was the oftentimes, oftentimes were just too tough and common workers did not have the savings to support themselves during a long strike. It seems of a confusing way to conduct a strike, but these were unsettling times in Brazil. And not really so confusing when you stop and think about the fact that a guy can go on strike for a few days, but when he doesn't have any food left for his family or himself, he may have to go back to work for a few days. A delegate from Brazil that could travel to World Labor Congress in Europe reported that Brazilian syndicalism was not plagued by socialist parliamentary illusions. In other words, anarcho-syndicalism in Brazil was still a revolutionary and not a reform organization. On May Day of 1919 in Sao Paulo, an anarchist rally attracted 60,000 workers who spent the day listening to revolutionary speeches. One month later, 20,000 factory workers struck in Sao Paulo. Around the same time as the May Day rally in Sao Paulo, another massive strike was brewing in Rio de Janeiro. Finally, on the 4th of May, 1919, 50,000 workers walked out of factories in Rio de Janeiro. Their demands were the same as always, at eight-hour day, 20% pay increase. Both the Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo strikes lingered on through June and July, until the government got serious about Brazil's growing urban labor problem. During this time, the Catholic dis Church displayed which side it was on. One Catholic center in Sao Paulo begged the workers to be peaceful and give unrestricted support to all conservative classes in the present emergency and to declare themselves at the side of the government for the repression of anarchism. With the government finally forcing the hand of the industrialists, the strikers in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro won an eight-hour day and a 20% wage increase. But it was a short-lived victory, as the trade-off for better shorter hours and pay increase was that workers had to give up their unions. An organization, Centro Industrial de Fisial e Tesalegum de Alternada, was set up to mediate the strikes. That's the government commission. My Portuguese is terrible. That's the government 
uh, commission to mediate this this whole thing, uh, including the workers getting their higher salaries, a 40-hour work week, and their agreement to drop these unions. Well, dropping these unions wasn't too hard because the workers were used to that. The anarchists would form an a union one day and they'd drop it a week later. So it wasn't a new concept altogether, even though it seems ridiculous for, from a distance. Shortly after the workers in Sao Paulo lost their unions, their new victories from the strike slowly started to wither away too. And in some of the same factories that struck, conditions reverted to pre-strike within a year. In other words, their 20% and so on, they all lost that within a year, along with their union. Brazil at the same time was getting serious about the anarchist threat. And in September of 1919, Brazil signed a pact with Uruguay, Argentina, and Paraguay to rid themselves of their mutual anarchist enemies. This was a direct result of an International Labor Congress in 1919 that called for the formation of a South American Syndical International, a conference that Brazilian delegates took an active role in. Almost immediately, the arrests and deportation started. Newspapers in the office of anarchists led labor unions were trashed. Labor unions were labor leaders were beaten and killed. The rebellious workers of Santos took instant action. In mid-October 1919, strikers from uh, Santos were arrested as part of the repression of labor activities. Leaders at the FOSP called for immediate general strike on October 20th to protest the arrest of strikers in Santos. Only four factories took part and the general strike was over before it had a chance to begin and it was considered a complete disaster for the FOSP. The amazing instincts of the anarchist labor leaders in 1917 were missing now as the Brazilian workers were not in a desperate food shortage and would not rise up solely for political reasons. Unfortunately for the anarchists, the failed Santos general strike started a self-destructing pattern for the anarchist labor unions. The exact same thing happened again when a general strike called in 1920 for factory workers in Rio um, de Janeiro to uh, arise and they did not. This pattern of failed general strikes would be the most important cause of the slow decline of anarcho-syndicalism in Brazil. Industrial Brazil was getting more concentrated. In 1920, Rio de Janeiro had 17,641 of the 19,924 textile workers. So I'd say 17 of the 19,000. Um, and in factories employing more than 100 people. 14,000 worked in factories that employed more than 1,000 people. The situation was similar in Sao Paulo, where large factories, employers had gotten better at spotting agitators and removing them before trouble started. At the third Brazilian Labor Congress in 1920, the Congress formed the uh, <coughs> Executive Committee of the Third Congress in English, which tried to do away with the COB. At this Congress, the delegates also voted unanimously to condemn an International Labor Congress that was to be held in Washington, D.C., because the employers and governments were allowed to choose the delegates for the Congress. The Congress showed a slow decline in anarchist sentiment and the poor growth in the popularity of communism, meaning Bolshevism or Leninism. 1921 saw another failed general strike in Rio where maritime workers were on strike. The government was now all too prepared for the anarchist predictable pattern of striking and union organizing. Before a movement could get started, they would step in and arrest all the labor leaders or those they suspected of becoming labor leaders and deport them. The slow decline of anarchist labor in the 1920s Anarchist activity slowed considerably during the 1920s for a number of reasons. Anarcho-syndicalism became a more concentrated movement, not reaching the large numbers it did earlier, but still keeping control over a number of unions in different parts of Brazil. One well-known Brazilian labor leader was José Rigetti, a weaver and an anarchist who founded the Textile Workers Union on April 24, 1924. During this time, the loose nature of the anarchist organization allowed this textile workers union to build ties to a number of community organizations. This came in a helpful way in July 1924 when a group of dissident military officers took over Sao Paulo as a coup against the government in Rio. 
During the July 5th to 28th period, this military coup ran the city and kept Sao Paulo in a state of siege. 1,000 Palestinos were dead, 4,000 more wounded in bombing and shelling, another 300,000 fled into the interior around Sao Paulo. In desperation, led by Jose Rigetti, people from all over Sao Paulo raided food warehouses in Bras and Muca, bringing the anarchists again a surge of popularity for their leadership and skills in direct actions and times of crisis. Once order was restored, the government blamed much of the chaos, chaos in Sao Paulo on, on the anarchists. This was cause for even more repression, as dozens of labor leaders and anarchists not associated with the anarchist movement were banished to rural prisons and labor colonies near the French Guinea border. French Guiana border. In 1925, saw more labor laws passed by the Brazilian government. This new law tried to enforce a two-week vacation work for workers and put down on child labor. As is often the case with labor laws, a chasm existed between the law and what is enforced. Another major factor in the decline of anarcho-syndicalism in Brazil was that the focus of anarchists shifted from labor to other concerns like fascism. The late 1920s saw the anarchist movement shift away their focus from labor and start to address issues that were harder to control and fight, such as the global rise in fascism and the growing communist threat. Now, by this time, the communists and anarchists are at each other's threat everywhere in the world. During the first 20 years of the century, communists had existed in Brazil, but their power was marginal as they were too removed from the masses and too authoritarian for the anarchists. In 1923, all of the communists in Latin America numbered about 50,000. In Brazil, former anarchists led by Alcegolo Pereira formed the Partido Comunista do Brasil in 1922. Over the next decade, most of the energies of both the anarchist and communist movements in Brazil went to discrediting each other. The largest, the largest issue of dispute in Brazil, as well as between anarchists and communists all over the world, was the uses of force and authority in the Russian Revolution. Anarchist papers like the famous A Pleb would print articles by Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman, well-known North American anarchists who had been to Russia at the invitation of Lenin shortly after the revolution. The communists would print revenge articles by Lenin denouncing Goldman and Berkman, and so in Brazil the political left eroded with bitter fights like these. The ideological dispute put the off workers from joining the PZP, and all during the 1920s their movement lacked the support of the working class. The anarchists were right to concern themselves with the spread of fascism, but unfortunately for them they lacked the power to do anything to halt it. Fascism rose in Brazil, just as it did all over the world, in direct response to the global depression. Brazilian nationalism was appearing in organizations like the Brazilian Integralist Movement, which was based in Sao Paulo, and sputtered the motto, God, Fatherland, and Family. The change from radical libertarian majority in politics and labor to an authoritarian majority was a slow process that took the entire 1920s to slowly unfold. At the same time, labor was shrinking in power and influence, and eager politician Getulio Vargas would rule from 1930 to 1945. He was now making his bid to come to power. In 1930, union membership for all of Brazil was only at 220,000, with a fraction belonging to anarchists, 2,000, and communists, 4,000. Uh, in 1935, one last attempt at uniting the parties of the left in Brazil took place. The National uh, Liberation Alliance was founded in 1935 and had four months of incredible growth until it was banned by the Vargas Junta. Even with unionizing labor being such a minority in a country of 30 million politicians like Vargas, knew the importance of controlling urban Brazil. These few workers produced more wealth with their labor than millions of rural Brazilians. One company in Sao Paulo in 1932 paid more taxes to the federal government than 15 of Brazil's rural states ruled by Candyland kind of operators. The government was supportive of unions, 
it could control. So the rest of those unions, besides the anarchists and the communists, were government controlled unions. When, uh, when the Catholic Action Confederation was founded in 1933, it had the full support of the government. These Catholic action groups were supported in a number of dioceses, but never really gathered any enthusiasm among the church's hierarchy. Because to the church hierarchy, any kind of uh, union organizing among the poor is uh, anathema. Another Catholic organization named the Workers' Circle tried to organize workers but made very small membership and it lacked the approval of the church, of course. Vargas came to power in 1930 after he declared that the election he had just lost for president was fixed. Almost immediately after taking power, he attacked the Brazilian left. Vargas closed out all the labor publications, arrested 600 labor leaders, prohibited strikes and meetings and demonstrations, and through his, throughout his time in office, the Vargas military junta had a perennial fear of the PCB in Brazil, that is the Communist Party of Brazil, as they were in constant contact with Moscow. Vargas used this as an excuse to restrict foreign membership in unions and to denounce communism as an exotic ideology and a non-Brazilian doctrine. This unfair unfolded, and on January 31, 1931, Vargas ordered all communists arrested and their property seized. Anarchists were less of a threat, as they had no national power behind them, as did the Moscow-backed PCB. <coughs> New State was what Vargas and his junta called the program they implemented, implemented, and they made a complete takeover of the Brazilian government in 1937. But it was a slow progress and not an overnight rebellion. The unionization law of March 1931 legalized trade unions provided they were Vargas trade unions. Vargas wanted to implement control over his unions in the same way Mussolini was doing in Italy. And, this, and he wanted to deal with his anarchists and communists in the same way Mussolini was dealing with them in Italy. So you can see that the Vargas military junta was following the fascist example of Italy. I'm going to stop here because I can see that we are uh, essentially at the close of this discussion and the tape is also running out. When we pick this up in the 2016 edition and go back to Brazil, We'll go back to this particular point in time and then bring it up to the uh, emergence of workers' power once again under uh, the Lula Workers' Party government 12 years ago and see how much has changed. Uh, but at any rate, we'll, we'll leave this discussion of uh, Brazil in its, early fascist, in its early fascist days. We'll leave it right here for now. And uh, that'll be the last of these Latin American lectures uh, for this year, 2014. All of these will be chapters in the 2015 edition, which I've now got to turn my attention to getting ready for publication and try and get that done in the next uh, three to four weeks. <clears throat>